R, uh, CEO. And I believe Bobette Fisher, if she's not on, she will be joining us. She's the CTAR president. Nick Kremitis, South Carolina CEO. And uh, President Owen Tyler from SCR. And I believe the um, majority of the Charleston Trident Association of Realtors Board of Directors. So welcome and, and thank you. Uh, before we, we get into um, our discussion, I wanted to give a, a brief introduction to Representative uh, Marvin Penn Darvis. Uh, Marvin grew, grew up in Charleston Farms neighborhood of North Charleston, uh, in the heart of District 113, which he uh, represents. Uh, he is a product of the public school system, Charleston County, graduate uh, at top of his class at Garrett Academy Technology in 2007. Marvin's a 2011 honors graduate from the University of South Carolina. I know that makes Nick Cromitis very happy. Um, his commitment to advocacy and leading uh, led him to the University of South Carolina School of Law, and he graduated in 2014. Uh, Mr. Pind uh, Representative Pendarvis has been admitted to the South Carolina Bar the same year. His uh, list of organizations include the South Carolina Black Lawyers Association, the American Bar Association, the National Bar Association, Charleston County Bar Association, seven, uh, 2017 Jim Clyburn Fellow, uh, former member of the North Charleston Board of Zoning Appeals, and serves on the South, South Carolina House Committee's Agricultural, Natural Resource and Environment Affairs and Legislative Oversight. Uh, he's also a father and a husband. So I would uh, like to uh, welcome Representative Penn Darvis. And just uh, before you'd like to say anything, but uh, just say to you, uh, you know, I know uh, 2020 has not been what any of us expected. So how are you doing? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Wonderful. Well, thank you for the, the great introduction. And it's a pleasure to be able to speak to your group. Um, uh, forgive me, I, I guess, to kind of open up. Um, I'm in my car. I'm in the back seat, so I've kind of set up office in, in the back of our car. Uh, my wife's driving us to Columbia right now, so um, I've got my son in the back seat. So if you hear some baby noises, uh, please excuse it. But we we are we'll ready to roll with this town hall, um, and I'll make sure that I do my best to accommodate everyone. Um, otherwise, I've been well. I mean, it's been a um, it's been an interesting time. I don't think it's a secret that. Um, What's happening in our world has certainly um, changed our perspective on a number of things. And so I'm just uh, pleased with the opportunity to be able to talk with your group uh, to discuss some issues that are important uh, to me, uh, that are important to you all, and, and, and ultimately to, that's going to be necessary for us to address as we move forward um, as a society. Uh, so I just want to thank you for the opportunity to allow me to present and, and talk about things that are important. I'm hoping that this conversation is one that that's very uh, fruitful, um, that that we get some from. Um, if you know folks have questions for me afterwards, or as far as some specific follow-ups, feel free to reach out to me. I'd be more than glad uh, to talk with everyone. But um, I'm, I'm very familiar with many members of the Realtors Association in Charleston, and so I just. Look forward to getting a chance to get acquainted with you all more on this afternoon. Well, well, thank you, and and, and hats off to your to your 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 wife for 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 driving and allowing you to uh, steal some of this family time from you. Um, uh, so you know, speaking of moving on to the uh, the state house, what do you think was the most significant progress made in this last legislative session um, <coughs> from your from your point of view? Yeah, so, well, obviously the, the session didn't end the way that any of us would have imagined with the coronavirus cutting things short. And so, so much of what we were looking to do this year was to pick up on some of the, the major initiatives that we started last year, as you all are probably aware of. And for those who don't know, we were in the Years session, so ending up through uh, both chambers and, and this time by the 21. Uh, 
one of the biggest things that we picked back up on at the forum legislation um, is many uh, education reform bill and it's out with the number of things that enhance the classrooms that gives teachers some relief uh, that that works on some of the curriculum um, and, and take into account many of the concerns that many educators had but the second part was to address the funding formula uh, which we never really got an opportunity uh, to get to um, I think the I'd say some of the biggest things that that were were done really um, at, when you talk about the business license you know one of the I would say that was a significant piece of legislation uh, there was a business license reform that was put through the house through the municipal association of South Carolina I know that they had been working closely with the chamber of commerce to try to get that done to kind of streamline the process we had been hearing from many counties and city across the state about uh, business licensing and, and trying to get that taken care of. So that was probably some significant reform. Uh, there were a number of things that ultimately did pass. Um, obviously, um, I don't think that, you know, for me, uh, at least, you know, some of the things that, that, that moved the needle that were really, we were looking and hoping to get passed um, ultimately changed our perspective when it came to, uh, when it came to the coronavirus, because that impacted the budget which obviously impacted where money went and, and changed our priorities ultimately, uh, which will cause us to have to go back in, um, in September to take up some of those things as well. So um, there was some progress made. There's some things that I've been working on personally, and I know that we'll, we'll get to, to that uh, later on in the, the town hall. Uh, but uh, overall, um, there's so much that was left to be desired because of how, how much the session was cut short. And so, um, outside of things that, that were, were lingering from 2019 that we picked back up on, um, so much was uh, left undone for 2020. Well, well, real, real quick, so in, in the terms of getting back to, back to the State House in September, what is the most important legislation or the budgetary items uh, that the legislature will need to address in September? Um, and, and is there anything that you're looking at uh, possibly that you, you might be pre-filing or, or so forth. That may be kind of early to, to talk about the pre-filing, but anything, issues out there? Did we lose it? Marvin, can you hear it? Mr. Representative Pendarvis, can you hear it? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. I don't know if you heard my last question. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, I heard your last question. Can you hear oh, me? Yes. Yeah, I heard your last question. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yes. I was in the middle of answering. I'm, I'm sorry. So what I think, so what ultimately ended up happening is um, many of you probably know we went back last session to take, uh, I mean, last uh, two weeks ago, about three weeks ago now, uh, to take up the, the COVID-19 budget. And so much of what we will be doing in September will be trying to allot the rest of the money that was of the $1.9 billion that came down from the CARES Act money. Um, much of that was allotted. Um, and so much of what we will be doing in September will be trying to decide how uh, to divvy up the rest of the money uh, that, that was not spent. I know that my personal priorities is trying to see that money go towards uh, minority businesses that need some relief. Uh, so much of the conversation centered on relief for, for businesses, which is important. Um, but I have been in conversation with the Chamber of Commerce, with a, a number of groups about the importance of making sure that we take care of the, the businesses that were hit the most. Uh, you know, it's the 41% of minority businesses will not reopen as a result of COVID-19. Um, you know, many of them were were hit at a disproportionate rate than many of their counterparts. And so, you know, for me, a, a lot of the conversation will be how we make sure that we take care of them, um, which make up the, the fabric of so much of what drives our communities. Uh, many of these gig economy kind of uh, uh, jobs that, that many minority businesses operate that really are the the engine that keeps our cities and counties going. And so it's, it's important that we take care of them in some meaningful way. And so much of what I'll be fighting for is, is to make sure that that is, uh, is going to be taken care of. But a lot of it in September, uh, you know, because again, we never formalized 
and finish the budget, which is why we had to 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 put it off until September. And so, in addition to that money, we still have to to formalize and, and finish the the actual budget. And so, a lot of the money that we originally appropriated in the budget, uh, we know went through. You know, that goes to the the state agency that typically to get get money and is allotted to try to to work on some of the issues that we have been dealing with. But a lot of that's going to change now. A lot of a lot of those those funding um, those priorities will, will shift, and so it's going to be interesting to see um, how we decide to allot that money when we get back. Um, as I said before, in addition to to fighting for the, the minority businesses, um, I'm just going to make sure that we do all that we can uh, to pick back up on on some of the initiatives that I've been pushing. Um, not necessarily budgetary items. I'm, I'm kind of waiting until 2021 to really work on some of the budgetary items because it's important for me, the issues that I'm, I'm working on and work through the, the budgetary process, but um, I'm, I'll be, working the the pieces of legislation that we're talking about as it relates to housing, as it relates to opportunity zones, as it relates to economic empowerment, uh, working that once we get back in September to get a pulse of uh, my colleagues so that once we, we get to November in the pre-filing period and once we get to January, we're ready to roll with something that's substantive and that'll really push the needle for South Carolina. Great, thank you. Well, uh, Representative Pendarvis, we'll stay with the, uh, the COVID uh, discussion here. Many industries, including real estate, are, are realizing the necessity of utilizing the increase uh, of technology and safety and security uh, for business. As an attorney, uh, do, how do you feel about Senate Bill 486, which was the electronic and re uh, remote notarization? So I'll, that's important. I'll tell you, um, one of the things that I got a call about was monetization when it comes to so much of, of how we do things. And I've been a notary. I have I've obviously need a, a, a number of documents notarized in, in, in my capacity and uh, aware of it when it was initially filed. I think some of the things that they had been working on with that. And so um, it's important. It's something that we need. Obviously, we need to continue going down the road of, of trying to, to make sure that we make these things as, as accessible and, and uh, expansive as possible, trying to, to go in line with as uh, technology and as society evolves. Thank you. That's, that's um, I, I want to, and you mentioned opportunity zones. Tim Scott's opportunity zones have been successful. Can you share more details on your opportunity zone legislation and what might that mean for uh, the folks of South Carolina? Yeah, I, I'll be glad to, and I'll take some time here to, to explain it because I want your your group to really understand. Um, but certainly interject if I'm running over time to, to keep with our schedule. But the the opportunity zones legislation really was was born and out of what I saw what Senator Scott had been doing and, and Senator Booker, who was a co-sponsor uh, out of Washington. And for me, it was about how do we improve and, and really develop our communities in a way where the tangible impact is felt by the residents who live there. And how do we use that as a tool to be able to attract and bring in the kind of industry, the businesses, the, uh, the housing that's going to really make these communities thrive and, and ultimately make them successful. And so one of the things that I originally saw, I said, okay, well, this is good. Obviously, a lot of it deals with federal benefit to capital gain. They've been using similar models. So, um, can you still hear me? Yep. Okay, wonderful. Uh, just, just let me know if you don't. I'm, I'm going to some copy, sir. But um, one of the things that um, that I reached out to some civil cities that have been doing some similar things. So, I reached out and went to Birmingham, Alabama, where they had been doing uh, something similar. They had some state legislation. To Baltimore, Maryland, where they have been 
very proactive in these things. I had, had conversations with some of the people in Virginia. Uh, we had talked with a, a number of people in, in Colorado and in Erie, Pennsylvania. And so I had really done my homework before I even worked on some legislation to figure out one, how are states utilizing this federal legislation and how is it being used to impact their communities? And that was last summer. And I used my feedback to from, from what I got to come up with a bill, working with staff, working with a number of groups that were interested in seeing something like this and pre-filing a pretty comprehensive piece of bills, about 19 pages in our final draft that looked at how we address the real needs of these communities when it comes to food deserts, when it comes to the lack of internet access, when it comes to transportation and trying to increase the modes of mobility, when it comes to housing, when it comes to opportunity, pun intended, and trying to, to bring in the jobs and to create the kind of environment that's going to make folks successful. And so when we got to that point, I knew it was a comprehensive bill. I had gotten some support from some folks that I knew would be interested, which led to us getting um, some bipartisan support initially, where we were able to get a couple of co-sponsors. Um, that once we got to December, I knew that we had an opportunity to really to push this. And so we had some conversations where we presented our idea to the governor's office. Uh, we met with the Department of Commerce. We had the education department in there because education was a component of it. And we shopped it around. And really what it, and I'm giving you this backstory because it's important to understand how we got here and, and what it's used for. And so once we got to January of 2020, that's when I, I initiated my Opportunity Zones tour. I actually went to go visit some of the places that I had conversation with. So we went to DC, we went to Baltimore, we went to Maryland, I mean, to uh, Alabama, and we visited some of these opportunity projects. And I'll tell you, I was blown away, Rob, with the impact that the state's um, ability to, to implement some kind of legislation, even not only on the state level, but sometimes even on the local level, and how they were able to bring up, uh, improve communities. Because my biggest concern with the Opportunity Zone legislation that originally was that it was going to lead to further gentrification and just displacement of our communities. And so in many respects, my, my bill was a check on the federal legislation because I knew that in and the on the local level, we had an opportunity to to really use this to improve communities. And so the bill does just that. It creates these different modes where if a developer who who sees a, a federal benefit and, and wants to take advantage of the capital gains and opportunity through opportunity zones and they're coming in or an investor is coming into an area, then that's good. We want them to come. We want them to invest, but we don't want them to invest in, and not understand the needs of that community. And so it's forcing them. It's an, and, and I, I say force is a little too harsh for words, but it's really encouraging and incentivizing them to have conversations with the members of those communities to come up with an agreement that's mutually beneficial that the residents can understand. And that's really going to lead to tangible impact on those areas. Because what I found was if the state and local governments can enact legislation that acts as a check on what the federal bill does, then these investors, when they come into the, these areas, they see the kind of social impact that they can have. And that it's not just about the profit. While yes, we want you to ultimately, and it's necessary that they ultimately make a profit because that's why they're coming in there that the social impact is there and that they're able to benefit from, um, that the community is able to benefit from their existence there by whatever they develop. Um, and that, that in turn creates and, and, and stirs up a, an atmosphere where you've got a thriving education system, where you've got housing that's being developed that's affordable for the residents that live there where you've got businesses that are starting up there where the residents can take advantage of. I mean, I could go on and on and, and in pretty detail, and, and certainly if anyone is interested in that particular topic on the call, reach out to me afterwards because I was blown away by some of the presentations that I had um, when I went to these cities and how they were using opportunity zones and, and creating leverage and being 
that was important to me. Um, and, and it's important because we've got my, my district is in an opportunity zone. Well, part of my district is in an opportunity zone. You know, my house is not too far from an opportunity zone. Um, I've got family that lives in an opportunity zone in North Charleston. So it's important that we really look at how we improve these communities from the bottom up and how we create and invest in these places and, and, and try to show the residents there and the, the existing businesses there uh, that you're valuable and that we want to bring out the best in you and, and create the kind of tangible benefits that's going to ultimately make everyone better and make this investment worthwhile for all parties. And so that's really what the Opportunity Zones legislation was about. I was very, very proud of the, the work that we got done. We knew that it was a large undertaking, and so we didn't go into it being naive. We knew that we were facing a, an uphill battle, uh, but I am happy to report that we, we have some success. We were able, uh, we weren't able to get a meeting we were able to have enough conversations and, and, and really generate enough buzz and build a foundation that I'm extremely optimistic. Once we refile in 2021, this is something that we'll be able to take up uh, because not only did we get the initial meeting with the governor, but we had a follow up meeting with him and his staff. And so um, that was important for us. And we've continued to be engaged by different groups that, that want to be part of this. And I see this as a real tool uh, to improve the most vulnerable areas of South Carolina. That, thank you. That was great. And uh, I, I know that uh, I would, and then I'm sure everyone, a lot of folks on this call would like to know more about the, the Opportunity Zone and what has been going on with you and, and where it is. And, and uh, so um, realtors uh, are one of the most politically diverse organizations. By that, we, we support Republicans and Democrats and independents um, throughout the state. And uh, and are invested in change and policy to ensure um, that will address inequalities in the terms of home ownership and increasing housing attainability. Uh, we're beginning to work towards social change, even in our own organizations, uh, and, and that's a great thing, but we need policy to create meaningful change. What policies needs to change to support real, real systemic shift uh, in our communities? Well, that's an excellent question, and that's something that I've really been Representative Pendarvis, we kind of lost you there. Can you hear us? We're, we're no good. I'll see that we. Where'd he go? Oh, there he is. We're muted. He's muted. We're not hearing you. I can hear you fine. Can you oh, hear me? Okay. Now we can. You're, you're coming yeah. loud and clear now. Yeah, yeah. I, I can hear you just fine. I heard everything you said. And so okay. the biggest thing from a general standpoint, and I'm about to get a hot spot here just to make sure we don't have that, that going again. But um, the biggest thing that we can do is, is really unlock the potential at the local level. And so that's really in empowering municipalities to make the kind of change and enabling them to kind of take advantage of, of the tools and, and expanding their toolkit to, take, to, to really address the housing needs. Uh, when I first got elected, one of the biggest pieces of legislation that I was in, a proponent of, and my predecessor was a, a co-sponsor, which was the Inclusionary Zoning Act. I know that that has been met with you know some scrutiny and, and mixed opinions, but in my opinion, the biggest thing that we can do is try to incentivize developers to be, to be active in trying to address the affordable housing issue. And so that was a big piece of legislation that I supported and, and I believe that that's what we're going to have to get to. But along those lines, what we ultimately really be, need to be doing is looking at how we enable 
municipalities to really address this problem. And so that's getting rid of the impediments that exist in their way that, that, that it serve as roadblocks to building housing, whether that be these, uh, the permitting process, if there can be something where you can expedite that, whether it be uh, these, these different fees that come along with it, you know, those are the things that are going to be necessary. But in a lot of ways, we have to be intentional in how we address housing. And so the, I've, I've been a proponent of, of the inclusionary zoning. I've been a proponent of, 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 of really unlocking the potential of municipalities to address it. I think that there are a number of tools that if you, you really are intentional about it, you can, you can address it. But I'm still learning. I'm, I'm still educating myself. I'm, I'll be participating in a conference um, that the, of a virtual conference this summer where we'll be talking about the different ways to address the affordable housing issue because it's an important one. And it's one that, that really is going to take the state um, and, and local governments to understand the importance of and, and addressing and, and, and looking at how we can address it. And so that's that's one of the biggest things that, that we need to be uh, focusing on. And, and that's something that I've been doing since I've been elected and will and, and we'll continue to do. Did that come out clearly? Sorry about that. Uh, so uh, that came in loud and clear. Well, what can we do as realtors uh, to help build stronger communities um, and be agents of change for uh, personal as well as our professional uh, lives? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'll tell you that I just got done um, a reading a, a book about the, the color of law, and it talked about the impact of housing policy which has led to the years of, of really what you see some of the segregated communities and the issues that we have in housing today. And it gave really a historical perspective. And one of the things that I learned is that, uh, that I've learned is that the realtors really stand in a good position uh, to one, address these issues head on, uh, particularly when it comes to home ownership. And so a lot of issues go back to, and I had a conversation with uh, and Josh Dix and I were, were talking about this recently, where you really need to look at one, how do we, with realtors, you, you know, most of them, you, you're out there trying to, to sell homes. And so in your profession, how do we look at, how do we educate people about the importance of home ownership? being able to build wealth, because again, it's about building communities, about really changing our family tree and, and really creating an environment where people are successful and, and, and people have the ability to climb up the economic ladder. And housing is an extremely important part of that. And so as, as a, an association, I think being very um, intentional about how we ensure home sustainability, home, home affordability is, is pressed upon in, in very vulnerable communities, um, being able to increase the amount of African-American home ownership, being able to talk about the, the roadblocks that exist there, being able to deploy realtors and educating them on that, and, and being able to have those conversations and talk about it. With the minority I think we lost, we lost Representative Pandora. I think we lost you. Are you muted? There we go. I'm here. What was the last thing you heard me say? Uh, I don't think we got much of it. So if you could recap it real quick. No, it's fine. It's fine. So the 
really what the, the realtors have to be doing is being proactive in how we unlock the potential of so many of our communities. You all stand in a good position because you're able to, to really talk about issues that are important, like home ownership, like access uh, to, to home ownership, educating people on the importance of home ownership and the ability to build wealth because of that. Uh, that that's extremely important. Uh, that is why it's necessary for us to, to be able to have these conversations and, and to understand as a, an association uh, that you all really stand in a unique position, in a, in a more unique position than any other group when it comes to housing, uh, because you're, you're right on the front lines, you see it daily, and you see the potential pitfalls and roadblocks. And so it's important in educating the public, educating your realtors, being able to talk about it um, intentionally as an association about these issues and, and how to address them in a meaningful way. And so a lot of it will become, you know, I've been having conversations with the minority realtors. We've been talking about issues that are important, issues that you all are, are aware of. Uh, we need to continue to elevate that conversation. The moment is right. Uh, we're at a, a, an inflection point in our nation's history where we're having to address issues that have continued to plague uh, communities that have been long neglected and underserved. And so the, the way we undo that and the way we tackle that is to be proactive and intentional in our conversations and to really be creative in the ways and understanding our roles and our different sectors of life and our different professions and how we can address these issues as realtors. I, again, you know, one of the biggest things that we can do to uplift communities is, is bring them to a point of economic empowerment. That's why I stress opportunity zones. That's why I've been very vocal about housing because I know that housing serves as a, a, a critical and invaluable first step in, in a lot of respects to addressing the needs of our communities and, and building equity. And so if we can do that by em, empowering realtors with the information that they need, but also making sure that they understand the importance of, of where we are and where we need to go, then I think we'll be successful. And you, you brought up a great point. And I also want to uh, make a note that the, uh, if you do have a question, the chat box is open. Um, and, and Representative Pandarva, since you, you did, did speak um, to a little bit of, of at a, you know, a point where um, we have an opportunity to make a difference and, and, and do better. You know, I've, 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 I've watched, I've watched you um, walk and um, in, in, in a silent, um, uh, to, uh, you know, George Floyd. I I've watched you actually in that walk, that march, shield people that were there, that were there to antagonize um, the march. And, and you stood there, and then I watched you give a, uh, an impassioned speech about having, you know, we, we need to have some uncomfortable conversations. Um, and then after the night in Charleston of the, of the, uh, of the, you know, the property damage and the riots and, and, and that type stuff. I saw you stand shoulder to shoulder with uh, Representative Gilliard and Senator um, Kempson. Uh, yeah. And um, I, you know, that, that happened, I think, I mean, I mean you, 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 when you gave that speech, it was a, it was a healing speech, but it also was a speech that there's more to be done. That's mm -hmm. happened, uh, you know, at end of May, um, and how do you feel we're moving, how we're doing now as we are today? Um, well, I appreciate you acknowledging that. And, um, and can you hear me? Okay. Just want to make sure we're clear. Yep. I, I stopped so I can make sure we, we finish this without any interruption. Um, but the, I appreciate you bringing that up because, um, I've been moved by what's taken place in our country over the last month. Um, it's affected me personally. It's something that I've wrestled with in my own uh, my own conversations with my family, just about the importance of this moment and what it means as a father, as a as a husband, as a member of this community, as a legislator. And so it it, it it's it's one where the community is reeling in many respects. And so when I was out there at the protest and and when I spoke after what happened downtown that night, you know, a lot of it, a lot of emotion was there because I really felt the pain and frustrations of so many of the people um, that were out there. And I understood that, you know, there was a lot that has to be done in order for us to really get to a place where we feel like progress is being made. 
over the last month, if there's anything that I've been pleased about is that the conversation has been elevated to a place where we're finally able to acknowledge that uncomfortable conversations have to be had and that there are institutions of, of systemic racism, institutions that must be dismantled, institutions that exist in all areas and in all industries uh, that we have to be able to attack and root out. Um, and, and the way you do that is, is by continuing to, to be intentional. And so for me, a lot of it was a soul searching, trying to really look at my role and the different roles that I play in this society and try to figure out how best to amplify my voice uh, to, to speak to issues that need to be addressed. And so it's been, it's been a month, you know, um, it's been a little over a month. George Floyd died May 25th, uh, Memorial Day. And um, it's been a little over a month since his death and, and a lot of the unrest that we've seen across the country. And, and there's, there's definitely been a shift in the movement because you've seen industry, you've seen big business, you've seen sport and entertainment respond in ways that they haven't responded before. And so I've been pleased with that. But ultimately, the, 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 the real telltale sign will come down the road to see how we sustain this momentum and what we use this moment for. Will it be a catalyst for constructive and productive change? Will it help dismantle the institutions that got us here and that put serve as roadblocks to, to really real advancement? Or will we have to have another one of these incidents for us to, to re-engage each other? And so... It's early, you know, I've been pleased with what I've seen so far to answer directly your question, uh, but I've been, um, I'm just, it's still a wait and see because a lot has to happen. I'm encouraged by a lot of the youth that, that are speaking out. I've been encouraged by what I've seen by um, big business and a lot of the industry that's out there. Uh, but we have to continue taking those action steps, continue to really evaluate our roles and try to figure out how we address this issue head on. And I think if we do that, then we'll get to a place where this is not only just a, not a moment, but a movement that sustains itself for a long period of time towards actionable, structural, and tangible change that people can appreciate, feel, and, and, and enhance their lives. That was, uh, that was very well, well, you know, I mean, very well said, uh, and and I'm, um, I'm, I'm, I can I can truly appreciate you and I looking at each other and saying, okay, I'm I'm ready to have an uncomfortable conversation, and and uh, and, and I appreciate you being the catalyst for that. Um, the uh, chat box is open if anyone would like to tap uh, tap type in a question. Um, if. Don't all jump at once. <laughs> uh, there, there, there has been a question about the landlord tenant reform. Okay. What's the quick? Let me see if I can see it. Uh, I think it came in on. Okay, it is was, it on uh, the it Facebook was or something? A private. Okay. Um, it's not a public. Where is What's that? The, or, um, oh, can you expand on it? Uh, that that you helped sponsor that bill. Yes, yes. Yo, around the same time, actually, not even then. It was at the beginning of the my second year in office. We introduced a reform to the South Carolina Landlord Tenant Act, where we needed to address many of the issues that existed in, in landlord tenant law. And the reason why is uh, I, I looked at it from two angles. One, I'm an attorney and, and before I was elected, a lot of my work was in civil litigation and I, I represented many tenants in, uh, in landlord tenant issues. And so I saw it firsthand at the courtroom. Um, and then also as a, an elected official, I got many, many calls from constituents and, and people who, who weren't even constituents, but understood my, 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 my issue and um, me being vocal about the issue and wanted to know what can be done because, you know, they constantly talked about the issue. So a lot of it was one, I had a conversation, I was really enlightening with many, with two attorneys that did pro bono work, uh, Matthew Billingsley and Nicole Paluzzi, where we talked about how the 
landlord tenant laws in South Carolina were extremely landlord friendly and that we needed to update them because they hadn't been updated in about 30 years in a real way and that we needed to get in line with many of our peers across the country uh, to address this issue. And so that was one of the things that I had to really look at and, and figure out how we, we do. So that was one of the issues, right? And then the, the second issue is, hold on for a second. And so the second, and so the second issue is, well, the, the second point is one of the things that um, we needed to look at was how do we, we streamline the process to make sure it's efficient, that it's more equitable, and how do we work with landlords to make sure that they understand their role in the process, but also tenants understand their role in the process. And so the bill was introduced. It didn't go anywhere initially. Um, but it did start the conversation and spark a, a movement where many tenants are understanding that they, they their rights have to be amplified. And so we we worked to tr you know I was a part of a group that that led the charge to get Charleston to do a pilot program where we have a housing court. So that was a part of the legislation that I found about the importance of having a housing court, similar to how the public defense defender system is, is. Is you know if you're getting an eviction, you need to have a lawyer, and so that was part of it. Is it's a lot more comprehensive, but um, suffice to say that we're moving in a direction that that we feel is comfortable. Uh, sometimes when you introduce the legislation, you get it passed. Sometimes it sparks the conversation for needed reforms in other areas, and I can say that the landlord tenant law did that and that um, the people who, who needed to pay attention are paying attention, and I'm actively working with those groups to try to figure out what could be done uh, to uh, really address landlord-tenant issues. Um, let's see, we've got a question here. It says, um, I know you're on state level. Have you had a conversation with Mayor Tecklenburg about the 21st task force policy? No, simply put, no. Um, I've, I've, I know Te Mayor Tecklenburg well. We have not talked about that, though. I live in North Charleston. Um, my district is mostly North Charleston. And so for that standpoint, um, I, I wouldn't be. I imagine if he had to talk with people first, it'd be people, the, the representatives in that area. Uh, but I am familiar with the, t the task force and, and members who will um, be part of it. And I think it's important that we, we have to uh, to lead the charge and trying to address policing. I will say this, though, I've been extremely impressed by how the city of Charleston has led the charge, at least locally, and trying to, to do a self-analysis of its department and trying to think about creative ways for, for them to be successful and, and meet the moment that this, um, that this time calls for. Well, I know our, our time is getting short since I hear the uh, little person next to you. Uh, oh, you're fine. We got it. He went for a little walk. So, I mean, we oh, anticipated okay. this. So it's it's no worries. We're all okay. we're all good. Uh, con uh, some concern among the property managers about tenants making upkeep to the property. Can you expand on that portion of the bill? So uh, that portion of the bill where tenants me making upkeep to the property. So a lot of it was that what I found landlords were evicting tenants because of the, there are certain ways, so there are certain reasons you can evict a landlord or evict a tenant in, in South Carolina. And a lot of it is, you know, you, you break the lease agreement. Um, you, you, you are engaged in some kind of criminal activity, which will be in violation of the, the lease agreement. You don't pay rent, which is, you know, a, a real most prominent example of, 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 um, of it. And so what you see is landlords have a duty to, to make sure that the property is habitable and that if a tenant um, lives there, that their safety, their health and their well-being is not jeopardized or compromised in any way. And what we found was that landlords were having serious issues within their apartments or their houses where you may have a, an AC unit that was broken or there was milled and mildew, things that would, you know, in the landlord tenant law and in the lease was the responsibility of the landlord, but the landlords were not um, undertaking their duty to address those issues. You know, many calls went unanswered, uh, many letters went unresponded to. And again, this isn't something that's across the board, but it was happening to the level where many tenants were left forced to either live there or move. Well, the waiting lists are, you know, can be months long. And so many tenants don't have the luxury to just get out and move. 
and, and maybe they can't afford to move somewhere else. So they're forced to endure a situation that could be very, very detrimental to their own health and their children's health, especially if you've got young kids involved. And so what we did was, uh, you know, we looked at a, a tool where if, a, you know, many tenants, if, if they have to take a, and, and out of their own pocket, if they have to address a need or a, um, or, or, or fix something in their house uh, that was the landlord's responsibility and that's going to really impact these tenants and the tenant can undertake that responsibility, pay for it. And that, um, you know, a portion of that could be credited toward the rent because if the landlord is not going to do it and the tenant is forced to do it and, and, it, and it can Im impact the tenant's health, then we need to allow them to be able to um, repair and deduct, which is what that means. So that's really what it, the basis for it. Thank you. Well, um, since we don't have any more questions, we're coming up on our time. I've, I've got some, uh, you, yeah. you want to end on a fun note? Sure. <laughs> uh, so I've got some just rapid fire questions, uh, just a little bit about you. Uh, let's see if you, uh, uh, so here's question number one. Uh, best piece of advice someone, best piece of advice someone gave you as a young Marvin Pendarvis? Oh, yes. Um, the best piece of advice that I've ever been given, and I've quoted it, it's hard to, um, it, it's hard to, to, to say one. So I'll give you two. And I know that's not your question, but I'll give you two. That's fine. And, and um, they've gone in, in my, my adolescent year. But the first piece of advice is what I heard when I was in college at the University of South Carolina. And um, my fraternity brother, he was an attorney that I was working for in Columbia. And he said this to me, and it is applied in my, my professional life, but certainly in my political life. And he said, um, remember Pendarvis, he said, in this world, and especially as you get going into law practice or even in politics, as he knew that my ambitions, you know, there are no permanent friends, there are no permanent enemies, they're just permanent issues. And so if you stick to the issues, then it'll take you far. I've used that and it is it had the most profound impact on my political career because we I always harken back on that. His name is Russell Brown. Um, and then the second piece of advice is, is um, something I heard a long time ago when I was young and it's continued to be reiterated, which is if not now, then when and if not you, then who? And so oh. that's the advice that I give to young people when it comes to them looking at how they make their mark. You know, why wait? If not now, then when? If not you, then who? So. That's great. That's great. What's uh, I know you you refer uh, you reference the uh, the color of law. What's what's another book that's sitting on your bedside that you're reading right now? So I don't know the term for this. So if anyone knows the term, please give me the term. But I'm one of those people who read multiple books simultaneously and, and have not finished one. So I will pick up another book before finishing and finishing one book. But the one that I'm actively reading right now is The Death and Life of um, American Cities by Jane Jacobs. And so it's um, about city planning and it's about um, the impact of sidewalks and the way cities are constructed that uh, make up a city. And so it's been pretty, I'm about halfway finished. My goal was to finish it by June because there's another book that I want to read. But I, um, I, I told myself I, I try to finish it at some point this month. But uh, that's what I'm reading right now. Light reading, obviously, R real light there. Uh, uh, wh who was your favorite grade uh, grade school teacher, uh, and what was the reason she was or he or she was uh, your favorite? My French teacher in high school, Miss Glover. Unfortunately, she's no longer with us. She died when I was in college, but she was my favorite teacher, uh, and the reason why is because she made one. Um, she's probably the one that made me want to pursue learning French while I was in college. And so I took several French class, some upper level French classes in college, but also she was just one of those teachers where she was very nice and cool and fun to be around. Uh, she was the the most diehard Clemson fan. And so it was like, we would always joke cause I was, I've been born, I was born a USC fan. And so we would always joke. And when the games would come around, she'd always rag on me if USC lost or, you know, I would, I would give it to her if USC won, which was rare when I was in high school and it's even rare nowadays. <laughs> So um, it was always nice to do that, but she just made it fun. She made learning French fun. She made the uh, fun just to be around. And she just had a, a spirit about her where after school, you would want to go to her classroom. If you weren't in her class and you weren't taking French, you want to go to her classroom. She just really endeared herself to me personally and, and as a student. So Miss Glover, for sure. All right. A couple more. And I'm going to let you off the hook yeah. here. So uh, 
what's your favorite song or artist or jam that if you're driving in your car down the road and it comes on, you, you got to turn it up just a little bit louder and, and kind of kind of sing along to it? Yeah, so I'm, I have a pretty eclectic taste in music, uh, but my favorite artist would probably be uh, Lil Wayne, um, and he's a rap artist. And there's some songs that, um, some older songs from one of his albums called The Carter Two that I still listen to. Uh, and you probably won't hear it on the radio, so I normally play the songs. Um, there are certain songs that kind of get me in the mood. So mm. there are songs that I play going to session, and you know, just to kind of get my mind right. <laughs> Um, there are songs that I'll play just in the car if I'm just trying to, you know, get myself pumped up for whatever reason, if I'm out to go give a speech or something like that. And typically it's a Lil Wayne song that gets me in the groove. So that's, that would be it. I, I cannot wait till we get back to session and we come up and visit. I, I'm just going to be wondering what Lil Wayne song is going to be playing for you. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Uh, something, uh, something most people don't know about you. Ah, well, um, Let's see, what don't people know about me? Um, I'm always bad at these, but um, <laughs> I'll give it my best stab. So, um, no, I, I guess the biggest thing is the one thing that people, a lot of people don't know because they don't assume, but I am the, I'm the only boy. I have four sisters. And so people are Ooh. pretty fascinated when they find out that I'm the, I'm the only boy of the family. Um, I guess my, my little fun fact and cool fact about me, I'm not very talented in many areas, but one thing about me that is, is I guess if people know is that um, I can say my ABCs backwards as fast, if not faster than I can say them forward. And so um, I, the reason being when I was in elementary school, I watched a lot of PBS. And so there was this show that came on PBS called Zoom. And if anyone who's like 30 years old or around that age, 30 to 35, you probably remember when Zoom used to come on PBS. And they used to have this, there was this one segment where they were saying the ABCs backwards. I'm like, oh, that'd be pretty cool to do it. So I just taught it to myself. And then I always just say it periodically. And so it's just like, if someone wants, you know, if, that, if, if there's a party trick, that's my party trick, right? So that, That's awesome. I, there's so much I've learned about you. I, this is great. All right, last question. And this is a serious question. Someone um, said, do it now. <laughs> I can do it now. <laughs> Z-Y-X-W-U-T. Michael Sally would say that. Yeah, I'll say it. Z Y X W V U T S R Q P O N M L K J I H G F E D C B A. Boom! Mic <laughs> drop. Awesome. That's impressive. All right, last question, and this is a serious question. Okay. Where do you see yourself politically in five years? And if you want to make an announcement today, we'll 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 push it out. <laughs> That's funny. Um, <laughs> I do have ambitions. Um, I will. I won't go out into the details of, of that for a variety of reasons, but I will say if I'm still in the House of Representatives in five years in South Carolina, then I'll be surprised. So that's all. All right. Well, and hey, I love serving it. in the House, but I've got some other things that um, I'm looking towards as well. So we'll see. Well, we look forward to it. Uh, Representative Penn Darvis, I want to send a huge thank you out to your family, I, uh, you know, of, of taking the time and, and, and stepping out. But I want to also personally thank you. Um, you're, you're doing great things in South Carolina. I think you, you know how I feel about you. I think you're a great man. And um, I, I truly appreciate you and appreciate your time. And if there's anything that we can do or personally, please do not hesitate to reach out. Thank you all for having me. I hope this was informative. Forgive me with the different connection and all of that, but um, I tried to do the best that I could. And uh, thank you all for having me. And, and if anyone has any follow-up questions, y'all can reach out to me at my, my email. You can reach me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I'm all over the place. So I'm not too hard to find. That's right. All right, guys. Thank you so, so much for uh, attending and uh, just appreciate you. Thank you. Have a good one.